When Joseph Smith published the second installment of his translation of the Book of Abraham, an interpretation of the circular hypocephalus in the Times and Seasons in March 1842, it contained an elaborate cosmology of the planets and stars that was ascribed to the ancient patriarchs. However, this cosmology was not what one would expect from an ancient author. It did not describe the earth as flat, nor did it mention the dome-like firmament in which the stars were set like so many shining jewels. Rather than luminous spots on the vaulted canopy suspended above the earth, Joseph Smith's scheme was both unique and consistent with what was understood and believed by astronomers and natural theologians in his day. The mix of modern astronomy and theological concerns resulted in a cosmology that is as foreign to present readers of Joseph Smith's revelations as ancient Hebrew cosmology was to Joseph Smith and his contemporaries. With the invention of the telescope, scientists peered at the nearby planetary orbs and some wondered if they too were inhabited. Some of Joseph Smith's contemporaries referred to the passage in Isaiah 45:18, which declared that God created the earth not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. Many, like the Reverend Amos Pattingill, reasoned, Jehovah intimates that it would have been inconsistent for him to create the earth had he not designed it to be inhabited. As he shows us a number of other worlds, must we not infer from his perfections that he acted consistently in creating them, that he created them not in vain, but to be inhabited? In his book, A View of the Heavens or Familiar Lessons on Astronomy, published in 1826 in New Haven, Connecticut, and adapted to the use of schools, the Reverend Pattingill concluded that the planets are evidently calculated and designed to accommodate rational beings. They are like this earth, and some of them vastly larger. Many circumstances constrain us to believe that they are filled with inhabitants, and that every fixed star illuminates worlds peopled with creatures like ourselves, but not involved with us in rebellion against the Creator. It is against this backdrop that Joseph Smith developed his scriptural cosmology. When Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon declared in 1832 that through Jesus Christ the worlds are and were created, and the inhabitants thereof are begotten sons and daughters unto God, and that the inhabitants of this earth were destined to dwell in one of three eternal worlds, early Mormons understood it literally. In 1833, Oliver Cowdery commented, it is a pleasing thing to let the mind stretch away and contemplate the vast creations of the Almighty, to see the planets perform their regular revolutions and observe their exact motions, to view the thousand suns giving light to myriads of globes moving in their respective orbits and revolving upon their several axes, all inhabited by intelligent beings. While Joseph Smith's cosmological development culminated in the 1842 publication of the Book of Abraham and explanation of facsimile 2, which articulated an elaborate system of ruling planets, headed by Kolob, the nearest planet to God's throne, that publication drew on the bound grammar, where, in 1835, he had given more details of his unique cosmology. Hi, I'm Dan Vogel. Thanks for joining me. Of course, apologists want to defend the book of Abraham as an ancient book, so they have labored to interpret the text consistent with a geocentric or Earth-centered cosmology. In this video, I will show that the so-called system of astronomy in the Bound Grammar and Book of Abraham are unique, but best understood in the context of early 19th century cosmology. I will also continue my response to the apologetic attempts to assign authorship of the Bound Grammar to W. W. Phelps instead of Joseph Smith. After a break of about two months, Joseph Smith resumed work on his grammar and alphabet of the Egyptian language. On the 1st of October, 1835, Oliver Cowdery wrote in Joseph Smith's journal, this afternoon, labored on the Egyptian alphabet, 
in company with brothers Oliver Cowdery and W.W. W. Phelps, the system of astronomy was unfolded. This, no doubt, refers to the bound grammar and alphabet of the Egyptian language, where the last seven characters, 36 through 42, unlike the preceding characters in Part 2, receive definitions in all five degrees and establish a hierarchy of stars and planets, organized much in the same manner in which Joseph Smith had recently organized the priesthood authorities in his church, which I will discuss shortly. Like Oliver Cowdery, Joseph Smith was no doubt aware of the passages in Josephus that mentioned that the descendants of Seth were the inventors of that peculiar sort of wisdom which is concerned with the heavenly bodies and their order, and also that Abraham had communicated to the Egyptians arithmetic and delivered to them the science of astronomy before Abraham came into Egypt, they were unacquainted with those parts of learning, for that science came from the Chaldeans into Egypt and from thence to the Greeks also. To what extent Joseph Smith was familiar with non-biblical sources dealing with Abraham is uncertain, but one oft-repeated account states, Jewish writers tell us that Terah, Abraham's father, made and sold images or representations of sun, moon, and stars to worship, and that Abraham, being well skilled in the astronomy of those times, learned from thence that the heavenly bodies could neither make nor move themselves by their own power, but that there was one only God who created, preserved, and governed all things, and that therefore they ought to worship him alone. This account is interesting in light of the book of Abraham's mention of Terah's idolatry, although it is not mentioned in Genesis. Some apologists try to cite ancient sources for Terah's idolatry as evidence for the book of Abraham's antiquity, but it has long been assumed to be the case based on Joshua 24.2, which states that Terah, the father of Abraham, served other gods. This passage, along with the Jewish legends available to Joseph Smith and his contemporaries through secondary sources, like the one just quoted, makes such evidence very weak. Regardless, that Joseph Smith would include a discussion of astronomy in his pseudepigraphic account of Abraham in Egypt was therefore not entirely unexpected. Of course, since Joseph Smith's Abraham received his knowledge from God through the Urim and Thummim, it had to comport with early 19th century understandings of cosmology, rather than ancient misconceptions based on the belief in a flat earth. As mentioned, an elaborate cosmology is unfolded in the last seven characters, 36 through 42, in the bound grammar. This chart shows these seven characters as well as their names and meanings. All but the three circular characters come from column three of the breathing permit of Hor. The circular characters are similar to characters found elsewhere on the papyri and in the valuable discovery notebooks. While it is possible that Joseph Smith saw the three circular characters in some of the badly preserved portions of the papyri, he may have nevertheless been influenced by the almanacs of his day, although the almanacs don't have the circle with the single line, and there is no clear example of the earth symbol among the Egyptian characters. The match of the earth sign in the grammar and almanacs of Joseph Smith's day is therefore significant. The first character of the seven is Jahniha, which is defined in the first degree as one delegated with redeeming power, a swift messenger, one that goes before another, one having redeeming power, a second person in authority, possibly referring to the Son, or Christ. The fifth degree adds one sent from the celestial kingdom. The next character's name is Jaoa, the earth, and its definition in each of the degrees leads to the unfolding of the Egyptian astronomy, with the fifth degree erupting into a long and elaborate explanation of the whole subject. First degree, the earth, including its affinity with the other planets, with their governing powers, which are fifteen, the earth, the sun, and the moon, first in their affinity, including one power. Second degree, the earth under the government of another, which is one of the fixed stars, which is called Oliblish. Third degree, the earth under the government of another, or the second of the fixed stars, which is called Enish Goandosh, or in other words, 
the power of attraction it has with the earth. Fourth degree, the earth and power of attraction it has with the third fixed star, which is called K.E. Van Resch. So far, we learn that the earth is in a group of 15 planets, which includes the earth, sun, and moon, apparently describing the solar system as it was then understood, which, as one 1829 book on astronomy described it, consisted of the sun, 11 primary planets, and 18 moons. This same source then names the 11 primary planets. Mercury, Venus, the Earth, Mars, Vesta, Juno, Pallas, Ceres, Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus. German-born British astronomer William Herschel had discovered the planet Uranus in 1781, but Neptune and Pluto were not observed until 1846 and 1930. Vesta, Juno, Pallas, and Ceres were counted as planets from 1808 until 1845, but are now considered large asteroids in the asteroid belt between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. Thus, Joseph Smith was apparently referring to the 11 primary planets, the Sun and Moon, and two yet-to-be-discovered planets. He evidently didn't count the other moons. I will discuss the significance of classifying the Sun as a planet shortly. These 15 planets, as understood by Abraham and the Egyptians, were governed by three fixed stars, Oliblish, Inishko Andosh, and Ke Van Resch. The elaboration of this occurs in the fifth degree. The Earth, under the governing powers of Oliblish, Inishko Andosh, and Ke Van Resch, which are the grand key, or in other words, the governing power, which governs the fifteen fixed stars, twelve besides themselves, that governs the earth, sun, and moon, which have their power in one, with the other twelve moving planets of this system. Oliblish, Anishgo Andosh, and Ke Vanrash are the three grand central powers that govern all the other creations which have been sought out by the most aged of all the fathers since the beginning of the creation, by means of the Urim and Thummim. The grammar then gives the names of the twelve remaining fixed stars. This is followed by the Egyptian names for the fifteen moving planets. In this image, only three of the names have been placed with the correct planet. The others are simply in the order in which they appear in the grammar. As we have already seen in our discussion of Joseph Smith's letter to James Arlington Bennett, discussed in the previous video, the grammar defines Flos Isis as the sun and Flo S as the moon. Oan Isis no doubt refers to the earth. Previously, Jaoa was defined in the grammar as the earth, but in the alphabet the earth was named Oan. It appears first on the list of 15 moving planets, followed by Flos Isis and Flo S, the sun and the moon. As previously quoted, the earth, sun, and moon were described in the same paragraph together as a unit when it states that the three governing stars governs the earth, sun, and moon, which have their power in one with the other 12 moving planets of this system. The pattern of 15 fixed stars consisting of three grand central stars and 12 fixed stars, as well as 15 moving planets, seems to reflect Joseph Smith's recent organization of his church hierarchy. In February 1834, Smith organized the Standing High Council in Kirtland, which included three presidents and 12 high priests. In July 1834, Smith organized another high council to preside over the church in Missouri, again with three presidents and twelve high priests. In February 1835, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles was organized. Described as the Traveling Presiding High Council, they operated under the direction of the three presiding presidents. In October 1835, when Smith was dictating his Egyptian cosmology, the Kirtland Temple was under construction and the plans for the first floor included an elaborate system of pulpits at the east and west ends of the hall, one for the Melchizedek priesthood leaders and the other for the Aaronic priesthood leaders. At the center of the west end of the hall 
were three ascending levels of three pulpits each, where the presidencies of the various quorums sat during meetings. Joseph Smith and his two counselors were seated at the top. On the right sat the twelve apostles, and on the left the twelve Kirtland High Counselors. Thus, it is quite clear that Joseph Smith had projected his priesthood organization into the heavens. The elaborate cosmological scheme outlined in the Bound Grammar fits nicely with the 1st of October 1835 entry in Joseph Smith's journal, which states that Smith, Cowdery, and Phelps were working on the Egyptian alphabet when the system of astronomy was unfolded. For various reasons, John Gee and other apologists have resisted making this obvious connection. Because Gee wants the translation of the Book of Abraham to precede the alphabets and bound grammar, he can't have the grammar project coming to a close in October 1835. This would give validity to the statement in Joseph Smith's official history that he began working on both the alphabets and bound grammar in July 1835. Although the statement in Joseph Smith's history was probably based on information from Joseph Smith and or W.W. W. Phelps, Gee ignores it and instead asserts that the 1st of October 1835 entry in Joseph Smith's journal refers to the beginning of the work on the alphabets and arbitrarily dates the bound grammar to sometime between January and April 1836. In proposing these dates in his 2017 book, he never mentions the astronomical material in the bound grammar. In his 2000 essay, Guy tried to argue that the unfolding of the system of astronomy mentioned in Joseph Smith's journal refers to the explanation of facsimile 2 that was published in the Times and Seasons in 1842. However, the only manuscript we have containing such an explanation is written in Willard Richards' handwriting and dates to 1842 in connection with the woodcut of facsimile 2 published in the 15th of March 1842 issue of the Times and Seasons. Guy's apologetic, therefore, proposes yet another missing text, whereas a more likely explanation is that Joseph Smith drew on the astronomical material in the bound grammar when dictating his explanations for the woodcut. In the same essay, Guy contends that the phrase in the journal entry, labored on the Egyptian alphabet, can't refer to the bound grammar because it bears the title Grammar and Alphabet of the Egyptian Language. It therefore must refer to the three alphabets. Consequently, Guy argues that because the alphabets don't deal with Egyptian astronomy, the part of the passage in the journal that mentions working on the alphabet was unrelated to the unfolding of astronomy. This requires us to believe that although the characters and their names were copied into part two of the alphabets, Smith, Cowdery, and Phelps failed to record their definitions but instead recorded them into a different document for which there is no evidence for its existence. The only reason for postulating the existence of another record is to introduce a later date for the bound grammar that contradicts Joseph Smith's official history. Such chronological manipulation can only be described as desperate. Guy's argument that Cowdery's use of the term Egyptian alphabet excludes the bound grammar is silly. There is simply no reason Cowdery could not have referred to the bound grammar as an alphabet. It was titled Grammar and Alphabet of the Egyptian Language because unlike the three alphabets, it included three short lectures on grammar. However, the bulk of the book was an expansion of the alphabets. Because the system of astronomy occurs in the alphabet part of the book, it would have been natural for Cowdery to refer to it as an Egyptian alphabet. At the top of page 9, at the beginning of the fourth degree in the first part, the page heading reads, Egyptian alphabet, fourth degree. The same appears on pages 13, 15, 20, and 33. The top of page 33 reads, second part of the alphabet, first degree. At some point, a label was added to the spine with the words, Egyptian alphabet. Guy also argues that the Egyptian alphabet, mentioned in the 1st of October 1835 entry, can't refer to the bound grammar because the latter contains the handwriting of Warren Parrish, who wasn't hired as Joseph Smith's scribe until the end of October. However, Parrish's handwriting doesn't appear until the end of the volume, occupying only the definitions for Kolob and three of the five degrees for the previous character.
named Ve Cli Flos Isis. Whereas, the system of astronomy was unfolded several characters before Parrish's involvement and is recorded in Phelps's handwriting. On the 7th of October, Frederick G. Williams made an entry in Joseph Smith's journal, stating that the Mormon prophet had recommenced translating the ancient records. Gee and Howglitch suggest that this is when Williams made his copy of the translation manuscript, but this is doubtful since, as discussed in the first video, evidence shows that Parrish and Williams wrote simultaneously from Joseph Smith's dictation and Parrish would not become Joseph Smith's scribe until the end of October. By recommenced, Williams probably meant since October 1st, when the Egyptian astronomy began to be unfolded. Contrary to the assumptions of Guy and Howglid, the alphabets and grammar were also considered translations. As Joseph Smith's history states, during the latter part of July 1835, Smith was continually engaged in translating an alphabet to the Book of Abraham. It is therefore likely that the entry in Joseph Smith's journal refers to at least character 37, which contains most of the details of the ancient system of astronomy. There is nothing surprising in the grammar's definition of the 38th character, the moon, only that it is the lesser light and that it passes between the earth and the sun, forming an eclipse. The definitions for the 39th character, Flos Isis, or the sun, are not typical because the sun, while described as the king of the day, is also considered a central moving planet from which those other governing moving planets receive their light. In referring to the sun as both central and moving, as well as a planet, Joseph Smith was reflecting the belief in his day, especially among the natural theologians, that the solar system was part of a larger system that moved around other systems which in turn moved around the throne of God. Commenting on the phrase heaven of heavens in Deuteronomy 10.14, Bible commentator Adam Clark said that the words were probably intended to point out the immensity of God's creation, in which we may readily conceive one system of heavenly bodies and others beyond them, and others still in endless progression through the whole vortex of space. Every star in the vast abyss of nature being a sun, with its peculiar and numerous attendant worlds. Thus, there may be systems of systems in endless gradation up to the throne of God. In his book, Philosophy of a Future State, first published in Philadelphia in 1825, Thomas Dick commented on the phrase, throne of God. It is now considered by astronomers as highly probable, if not certain, from late observations from the nature of gravitation, in other circumstances, that all the systems of the universe revolve round one common center, and that this center may bear as great a proportion in point of magnitude to the universal assemblage of systems as the sun does to his surrounding planets. And, since our sun is 500 times larger than the earth, and all the other planets and their satellites taken together, on the same scale, such a central body would be 500 times larger than all the systems and worlds in the universe. Here, then, may be a vast universe of itself, an example of material creation exceeding all the rest in magnitude and splendor, and in which are blended the glories of every other system. If this is in reality the case, it may, with the utmost emphatic propriety, be termed the throne of God. This grand central body may be considered as the capital of the universe. Joseph Smith's definition of Flos Isis moves beyond the sun to include in the fourth degree the highest degree of light, which illuminates the face of millions of planets. This is elaborated in the fifth degree to describe a grand center of light. Flos Isis, the highest degree of light because its component parts are light the governing principle of light, because God has said, let this be the center for light, and let there be bounds that it may not pass. He hath set a cloud round about in the heavens, and the light of the grand governing or fifteen fixed stars center there. Apparently, Joseph Smith believed the sun was in an orbit around this grand light center, which explains why he described it as both a central and moving planet. Indeed, as previously mentioned, 
he included the name of the sun, Flos Isis, among the fifteen moving planets. Joseph Smith's referring to the sun as a planet reflects the belief among his contemporaries that all the planets were inhabited worlds, including the sun. Astronomer William Herschel was one of the earliest from the scientific community to receive popular notice for his ideas about the inhabitants of the sun and moon. As one scholar summarized his views, Herschel thought it was possible that there was a region below the sun's fiery surface where men might live, and he regarded the existence of life on the moon as an absolute certainty. The Rev. J. L. Blake's first book in astronomy, adapted to the use of common schools, which went through many editions, included a discussion about the sun in 1831. The sun was formerly supposed to consist of liquid fire. By modern astronomers, this theory has been found untrue. They have supposed, with more plausibility, that it is a solid body surrounded by a luminous atmosphere. The similarity of the sun to other globes of the system in solidity, atmosphere, surface diversified with mountains and valleys, and rotation on its axis, lead us to conjecture that it is inhabited, like the rest of the planets, by beings whose organs are adapted to their peculiar circumstances. A revelation Joseph Smith dictated in 1832 becomes poetic in its description of God's creation when it declares, The earth rolls upon her wings, and the sun giveth his light by day, and the moon giveth her light by night, and the stars also give their light, as they roll upon their wings in their glory, in the midst of the power of God. The revelation then poses a question, Unto what shall I liken these kingdoms, that ye may understand? The answer is given in the form of a parable, in which a farmer visits his servants one at a time, working in different areas of the field, and concludes, Unto this parable I will liken all these kingdoms, that is, the earth, sun, moon, and stars, and the inhabitants thereof. Exegetically, the parable asserts that the earth, sun, moon, and stars are inhabited, and it was precisely this way early Mormons understood it. Hiram Smith, Joseph Smith's brother, alluded to this revelation when he declared in a public discourse in Nauvoo in 1843 that every star that we see is a world and is inhabited the same as this world is peopled. The sun and moon is inhabited, and the stars are inhabited the same as this earth. They are under the same order as this earth. Three of the degrees for Ve, Cly, Flos, Isis as well as all five degrees of the last character, Kolob, numbers 41 and 42, are written in the handwriting of Warren Parrish, who was hired as Joseph Smith's scribe on the 29th of October, 1835. Joseph Smith saved the best for last, for in the fifth degree we are told, Kolob signifies the first creation nearer the celestial kingdom, or the residence of the Lord, first in government, the last pertaining to the measurement of time the measurement according to the celestial time, which signifies one day to a cubit, which day is equal to a thousand years according to the measurement of this earth, or Jaowa. The length of Kolob's revolution reminds one of Thomas Dick's speculations about the enormity of the throne of God and the vastness of the system in orbit around it. In the first degree, we are told, Kolob signifies the first great grand governing fixed star, which is the farthest that ever has been discovered by the fathers, which was discovered by Methuselah and also by Abraham. And in the second degree, that Kolob signifies the wonder of Abraham, the eldest of all the stars, the greatest body of the heavenly bodies that ever was discovered by man. This reminds one of what Josephus wrote about the descendants of Adam's son, Seth, being the inventors of that peculiar sort of wisdom, which is concerned with the heavenly bodies, and their order, and also that Abraham had communicated to the Egyptians the science of astronomy. Later, in Nauvoo in 1842, when Joseph Smith dictated chapter 3 of the book of Abraham, he drew on this material in the grammar, And I, Abraham, had the Urim and Thummim, which the Lord my God had given unto me in Ur of Chaldees. And I saw the stars, that they were very great, and that one of them was nearest the throne of God, 
and there were many great ones which were near unto it. And the Lord said unto me, These are the governing ones. And the name of the great one is Kolob, because it is near unto me. I have set this one to govern all those which belong to the same order as that upon which thou standest. And the Lord said unto me, by the Urim and Thummim, that Kolob was after the manner of the Lord, according to its time and seasons, in the revolutions thereof, that one revolution was a day unto the Lord, after the manner of reckoning, it being one thousand years according to the time appointed unto that whereon thou standest. When Joseph Smith published this account in March 1842, he included explanations of facsimile too, which also dealt with ancient astronomy and were also inspired by the bound grammar. Several Mormon apologists have tried to argue that the Book of Abraham describes an earth-centered universe as would be expected of an ancient record, rather than a sun-centered solar system as assumed by Joseph Smith and his contemporaries. However, since Abraham was dependent on revelation through the Urim and Thummim, one would expect his views to surpass his contemporaries, and even Joseph Smith for that matter. In a 2005 essay, Gee, together with fellow apologists William Hamlin and Daniel Peterson, asserted, If Joseph Smith is to be considered the author of the Book of Abraham under the influences of the astronomical speculations of his day, we would expect to see a heliocentric worldview espoused in the text. A careful reading of the Book of Abraham, however, shows that the text is describing a geocentric system. They briefly discuss four ancient versions of the geocentric model. However, the model they use to interpret Abraham chapter 3 requires the earth to be spherical, with the sun, moon, and planets revolving in concentric circles around it, a model that dates many centuries after Abraham. Indeed, all but one of their examples range from Greek philosophers in the 3rd century BCE Greece to Dante in 14th century Italy. In his 2017 book, Introduction to the Book of Abraham, Guy even includes a depiction of a geocentric system by a 16th century Portuguese cosmographer, rather than what Bible scholars have generally depicted for the Old Testament. Of course, the concept of a spherical earth did not exist at the time of Abraham. Philosophers in 6th century BCE Greece are credited with the discovery of a spherical earth, although it would not become generally accepted until it was confirmed by Hellenistic astronomers in the 3rd century BCE. Guy thinks Abraham III describes a similar cosmology because it represents planets, including the sun, moon, and stars, as having revolutions. In his 2017 book, he quotes Abraham 3, verse 4, which states that Kolob was after the manner of the Lord, according to its times and seasons in the revolutions thereof, and applies it to all the planets except the earth, and then states, these lights revolve around something, and concludes it is the earth. Thus, it is quite clear that Guy has imposed his geocentric model onto the text. For the text itself says nothing about the revolutions of the planets or a central and motionless earth. The text only implies there is a measurement of time based on revolutions, but nothing is said to exclude the earth from the same measurement, or that its times and seasons, days or years, are measured in a different way. In their 2005 essay, Guy Hamlin and Peterson also make unwarranted assumptions and argue that the case for geocentricity is clear because there are frequent references to a hierarchy of celestial bodies, each one higher than the preceding, and all above the earth. In other words, according to these authors, each succeeding planet is slower than the previous because its revolution around the earth is longer. As Guy states in his 2017 book, the greater amount of time is associated with a higher orbit. The higher orbits are larger and take more time to traverse. Thus, the longer the time of revolution, the higher the light or planet is above the earth. None of this scheme is explicitly stated in the text of Abraham. These authors have simply imposed their model onto the text. While this hierarchy is established by the slowness of movement, and the text places one planet above another, there is no reason to conclude above means each succeeding planet 
is slower than the preceding one because its orbit is longer. Rather, above refers to the placement in the time hierarchy without reference to its position in a single system relative to a central Earth. Indeed, the repeated hypothetical reasoning implies a random distribution. Abraham 3.8, for example, states, And where these two facts exist, there shall be another fact above them, that is, there shall be another planet whose reckoning of time shall be longer still. Again, Abraham 3.17 repeats this principle. Now, if there be two things, one above the other, and the moon be above the earth, then it may be that a planet or star may exist above it. That is, somewhere in the universe, not the next planet in the orbit around the earth. If position in the hierarchy is determined by the slowness of revolutionary movement, then the text implies the earth is below the moon in the time hierarchy because it moves too fast not because it is motionless. The randomness of the hypothetical is mirrored when the text parallels the hierarchy of planets with the hierarchy of spirits. How be it that God made the greater star, as also if there be two spirits, and one shall be more intelligent than the other, there shall be another more intelligent than they. I am the Lord thy God, I am more intelligent than they all. Clearly, these apologists have read too much into this hypothetical language. While these authors restrict their analysis of Abrahamic cosmology to the text of the Book of Abraham, Joseph Smith provided more details in his Egyptian grammar. Guy, Hamlin, and Peterson note that the concept of K. E. Van Rash governing fifteen fixed planets or stars, mentioned in the Explanation of Facsimile 2, is problematic from the view of ancient and modern astronomy. They conclude that this seeming problem derives from Joseph Smith's modern interpretations, not from the ancient text of the Book of Abraham. However, Joseph Smith drew on the bound grammar for his explanations of facsimile 2, and the grammar is said to be a translation of characters from column 3 of Hoare's Book of Breathings, the source of the Book of Abraham. The grammar is the earliest text containing the unfolding of the system of astronomy mentioned in Joseph Smith's journal entry for the 1st of October 1835, and therefore provides a more complete interpretive context from which to understand the Book of Abraham's cosmology. Unfortunately, because our three apologists are secure in their dismissal of the bound grammar as the work of W. W. Phelps, they fail to even acknowledge its existence which is a fatal flaw in their apologetic. Nevertheless, Guy, Hamblin, and Peterson note that figure 5 of facsimile 2 describes the sun as a moving planet, which they state does not fit with 19th century ideas, but which perfectly matches geocentric thought. However, these authors have overlooked the ideas of 19th century natural theologians like Thomas Dick and failed to consider the context of the sun's movement in facsimile 2 which states that the moon, the earth, and the sun have annual revolutions, which is inconsistent with the apologist's geocentric models. Joseph Smith took this statement from the bound grammar, where in the fifth degree the word flow s signifies the moon, the earth, and the sun in their annual revolutions. In the fourth degree, flow s represents the moon in its revolutions with the earth, showing or signifying the earth going between thereby forming an eclipse. Here, the Earth moves into a position between the Sun and Moon, causing a lunar eclipse, which eliminates any geocentric model requiring a flat Earth, like their example from the Middle Kingdom in ancient Egypt. In the bound grammar, Flos Isis, the Sun, is said in the second degree to be the central moving planet, from which the other governing moving planets receive their light, having a less motion, slow in its motion. Obviously, a central sun and a moving earth do not support any of the apologists' geocentric models. Yet the sun is also said to be moving slowly around something, which is consistent with the model of the cosmos proposed by Dick and other natural theologians in Joseph Smith's day, contrary to the apologists' assertion. In the grammar, Kolob is described as one of the fifteen fixed stars or planets, 
but it is also described in the book of Abraham and figure 5 of facsimile 2 as having a revolution. The ancient model cannot account for Kola being described as both a fixed star and a moving planet. The only way to account for it is for Kolob to be at the center of a system, and for that system to be at the same time revolving around the throne of God, much as the natural theologians of Joseph Smith's day speculated. Thomas Dick noted that it had recently been discovered that the principal fixed stars have a certain apparent motion, which is nearly uniform and regular. These motions seem evidently to indicate that the Earth and all the other bodies of the solar system are moving in a direction from the stars in the southern part of the sky towards those in the northern. Dr. Herschel thinks that a comparison of the changes now alluded to indicates a motion of our Sun with his attending planets towards the constellation Hercules. And since the universe appears to be composed of thousands of nebulae, or starry systems, detached from each other, it is reasonable to conclude that all the starry systems of the universe revolve round one common center, whose bulk and attractive influence are proportionable to the size and the number of the bodies which perform their revolutions around it. This model of the cosmos, which Adam Clark called Systems of Systems, provides the best framework for interpreting Joseph Smith's explanation of Abrahamic cosmology as he conceived it in October 1835. Later, when dictating chapter 3 of the book of Abraham, he simplified it for the purposes of making an analogy between the hierarchy of planets and the hierarchy of premortal spirits. At the same time, he also drew on the bound grammar for his explanations of facsimile 2, indicating his belief that its content was inspired. To this point in Joseph Smith's work on the Egyptian papyri, only a rough draft of the first three verses of the book of Abraham existed which Phelps had recorded in the translation book, the pages of which were subsequently removed from the book. Two entries in Joseph Smith's journal for the 19th and 20th of November 1835 in the handwriting of Warren Parrish mark the probable time when Parrish and Frederick G. Williams served together as scribes for Joseph Smith's dictation of Abraham chapter 1 verse 4 to chapter 2 verse 2. The entry for the 19th states that Joseph Smith went in company with Dr. Frederick G. Williams and my scribe, Warren Parrish, to see how the workmen prospered in finishing the house of the Lord, and that I returned home and spent the day in translating the Egyptian records. On the following day, Parrish recorded in the same journal that Joseph Smith spent the day in translating and made rapid progress. As discussed in a previous video, in Parrish's absence, Williams continued recording an additional paragraph, comprising Abraham chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. Very soon afterwards, Parrish copied his and Williams' transcriptions into the translation book, following Phelps' entry. After which, Parrish began recording Joseph Smith's dictation directly into the translation book, which brought the text to Abraham chapter 2, verse 18. This likely took place four days later, when on the 24th of November, Parrish recorded in Joseph Smith's journal, In the afternoon, we translated some of the Egyptian records. On the next day, Parrish recorded, spent the day in translating. On 26th of November, Parrish wrote the last entry in Joseph Smith's journal to mention work on the Egyptian materials until 1842. We spent the day in transcribing Egyptian characters from the papyrus. On the same day, Parrish also recorded that Smith complained that he was severely afflicted with a cold. On the following day, both Smith and Parrish were sick. On the 28th, Smith said that he was considerably recovered from my cold, and I think I shall be able in a few days to translate again, with the blessings of God. However, although Smith called the West Room on the third story of the temple his translating room, there is no evidence of translating during the remainder of his residence in Kirtland. Please join me in part six, where I will discuss the publication of the Book of Abraham in 1842 and Joseph Smith's dictation of the last three chapters. I will also discuss the apologist's desperate attempt to date these chapters to precede the creation of the bound grammar. I'm Dan Vogel. Thanks for watching.